My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to another episode of How to Disaster, a podcast to help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. One of the most important things a community can address post-disaster is around mental health. The trauma that uh, comes with um, undergoing such a major disaster is really something so profound that there are people who specialize in this in particular. One of the biggest questions that we get from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors is, what can we do to help our community, you know, recover their insides and reimagine a new tomorrow? We know that the stages of grief and disaster are, are much like the stages after a death because you can't actually go back to the day before. So we've invited an expert in this area, Dr. Adrian Hines on with us today. Uh, Dr. Hines uh, designed and did the implementation with Debbie Mason and um, in our area post 2017, um, designed a wildfire mental health collaborative. And the genius of it was they were able to intersect um, technology with um, modern um, understanding and science around trauma and mental health care. And at the same time, make sure that every person in our 500,000 person county was eligible for some kind of very um, uh, well-designed and very accessible um, treatment around traumatic mental health care related to a disaster. So I'm very pleased to have Adrian with us today and welcome. So I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Hines to the podcast today. Um, You know, I just want you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your specialty and um, how it relates to our subject here, which is how to disaster. Well, thanks so much, Jennifer, for having me. This is certainly a cause that is near and dear to my heart. I am a clinical and research psychologist, and I um, am based at the VA National Center for PTSD in Stanford University, and I specialize in the treatment of trauma, and specifically with creating digital interventions, such as mobile apps, to help reach people in a in places where they normally might not access help or services. And in terms of why this is so exciting for me is, you know, I was kind of a a resident of Healdsburg. We were in San Francisco. We had been in a four floor walk up, two kids, no elevator. And we just thought what a lifestyle change we need. (laughs) And so we really uh, overhauled kind of our are thinking about what our values were and we moved to Sonoma where it's just this lovely community where you know your neighbors and you uh, say hello to people on the street and uh, you know to to become part of that and so welcomed into it and then to have these collective fire events happen really shaped my trajectory so you know I then became involved in the intersection of climate change and mental health. So one of the first things that happens when we enter into a community that they want to talk about is um, is the collective trauma, the mental health challenges of a um, after a, a wildfire. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was we've we've talked about wildfires for decades, but these fires that we're experiencing are mega fires. They are not your traditional calm, um, mild, or wildfire. And that really, I think, plays into the uh, t- resulting trauma. It feels like a fire monster behind you. So you experienced that in 2017, and you sort of saw your new community. Uh, while well, we all came together, and it was an incredible human experience. We were also left traumatized. And then you worked with the Northern Sonoma County Healthcare Foundation, um, whose ED at the time was uh, Debbie Mason, who we've also had on the podcast. I love Debbie. Um, to design, really use technology um, to to, um, design an app and at the same time trained hundreds and hundreds of people in trauma-informed care. So I'm hoping you can talk about, you know, that moment when you all of a sudden saw the 
the impact of this mega fire event where 6,000 homes were burned in one night and go from there in, your, in the development. You're so spot on in that this feels qualitatively so different from other types of disasters. You know, I grew up in North Carolina, we have hurricanes. You get, you get more of a heads up. They're kind of a discreet event, they come and they go. And this one felt imminently threatening, not just that, that terrible night, but for, for weeks. And the, the triggers, the reminders, the air quality, the, you know, the displacement, all of that was so evident and acute for weeks thereafter. It, it just wasn't like the threat was, no, was not gone. And so our nervous system stayed on high alert for a, a, quite a bit. 24 days and yeah. you know with is that what it was yeah it felt like 24 years yeah <laughs> um and no Debbie Mason she is just this incredible visionary she had done a lot of hurricane relief work in Florida and recognized you know these disasters they they destroy homes they destroy places of work and worship so forth but really there's there's a ripple effect upwards of a decade on the mental health effects that come with um, disaster and getting ahead of that and recognizing we need an ecosystem of mental health support and services to foster resilience. You know, I think we're just starting to learn that, you know, it's more than just physically recovering. There's a, there's an emotional and spiritual piece to it as well. And, well, and working with Debbie, though, you designed, you designed a system, which I was so impressed by. I, even at the time, I remember thinking, um, you know, miss, miss thinking, well, I'm a helper, so I'm not, I'm not going to jump in line for any help at all, which is not the right way to go, by the way. Um, but I knew that if I, if I wanted help, that there was an avenue for me to get it, simply by virtue of having lived here and experienced it. And you weren't saying, we're going to means test you. You didn't like cut out a swath and only decide to um, and treat that side of our mental health, but instead you guys looked at the whole community and like there was yoga classes, there were people who could do group therapy, and there was also the app for every student. So can you talk about like, like how do you sit in front of a community and really serve the people in front of you? Like that's a talent that it, a lot of people actually um, don't have and don't even know that they don't have it. Exactly. That's why we kind of targeted the whole community or really anybody that felt impacted by the wildfires, because we have a long way to go and we're getting there um, on educating folks about here's the mental health effects that you might expect one week out, one month out, one year out. And now we're four years out and getting more um, different types of reactions when we smell smoke versus the 2017. And just recognizing that we have to not only go beyond education, we need mental health action. And so we have to make it incredibly easy for completely overwhelmed folks who have a lot of competing priorities and not a lot of time to access services and to educate them about, it. well, here's, here's some signs that you might benefit from taking some time for self-care with this mobile app called Sonoma Rises or creating a community that looks at the mind-body connection with trauma-informed yoga. We're even going to see a healthcare professional who's trained in trauma-informed psychotherapy practices to get you back on track. And it's sort of like, an, it, it, it was like having an emergency room for mental health care on a community-wide level. So can you talk about the difference between how you would design, what, how something is designed for more immediate, the sort of emergency mental health, um, especially in those first uh, 12 to 24 months? Mm -hmm. Well, so FEMA, which most people are familiar with, comes in and offers psychological first aid. And then there's uh, local programs who've done a beautiful job of meeting people where they are literally going to their home to offer these acute services. They're not therapy. They're kind of more problem solving, um, connecting folks to different resources and services. So it's not really processing what happened in the acute stages. Um, and so what we were trying to address is, you know, what happens six months later when your adrenaline is just kind of faded and you're getting in fights with your spouse, you're not sleeping, you might be drinking more to cope, you're more irritable around your kids, you can't focus at work. What do we do when that stuff starts to sneak up? And how do we 
not only educate people about the signs of trauma, but give them something they can access and, and, and offer like different approaches. You know, one size does not fit all. So we wanted to offer step levels of care. And that's a, it's a, cre it was a creative approach that was actually, uh, but it was scientifically based and it was really designed for here, but other communities can take lessons from that. We've certainly done this, you know, the C2C calls and what I'm hoping is, um, you know, a mental health care toolkit essentially that we can offer to communities or an app. And you and I talked about this, that um, that can be supported for the long term um, as we are pivoting to an organization that will serve 11 states, mostly rural areas. One of our main concerns is how do you make sure that everybody gets equal access to the care that they need and may not even know that they need until six months later when everybody else has sort of faded and the drama is in the background and you're really starting to understand the reality of how difficult that recovery is going to be and that your mental health actually has to be part of that equation. And so, um, I, anyway, you, you, I love the, uh, I, I love the, the notion of tech. Like we do this podcast because my dream is there'll be somebody like in some corner of a totally rural state and they will have just gone through a disaster and they'll be like, oh man, I don't know how to do that, but I can take this one piece um, at a time, this one podcast based upon subject. And, and I'll take on what I can. And then I might come back, you know, four months later and look at another one. So we have no expectations that, you know, this is going to blow up or go viral, but we're really just hoping to use technology to help the uh, a community that we may never even meet or know. Um, so I, so can you talk about your, your really, it's a passion um, and a and very smart one about how to use technology in a way that can actually democratize care, especially post-disaster. Beautiful question, and uh, it's one that excites me a great deal. I, as you, I think democratizes is, is just a great word to sum up what can be achieved at scale with digital mental health interventions. So they knock down all the traditional barriers of geography for someone who lives in a rural uh, location, uh, competing time priorities. They, if you're a caregiver or a parent and you just can't get to appointments, if you um, you have trouble accessing it because of cost. You know, these are more affordable solutions for individuals. And I get excited for them, especially as we're kind of entering in the, the later chapters of COVID in the United States. We've seen the transformation and how acceptable these digital health solutions have become and how desirable they are when we you know we're all stuck at home and need, to, you know, a way to connect with that can be an opportunity for just kind of reaching folks where they are 24 seven from their couch and making it easier to say yes to accepting help. I like it because it meets people where they're at, which is a really hard, which is like, it's the most, it's the most basic um, tenant for us of doing disaster work is uh, we don't figure out what we can do to you. We figure out what we can do for you. And we do that by asking you know, what do you need and how can we help? And I know that it is the number one question that I get asked though, is, you know, how do we provide uh, mental health care, especially because the communities that we serve, especially in those first six months, um, I am glad that there's less of a stigma attached to it. Um, do you, I mean, can you comment on that? Do you feel like there's a, a wave of greater acceptance coming, especially because of COVID? And how did you take the system that you created and adapt it into something that could serve COVID? during COVID. Yeah, so that's a fun origin story. And by the way, we have taken a lot of these learnings and descriptions of our failures and our small wins. And we have published this in an upcoming article in uh, Psychological Services, which is a journal of the American Psychological Association. So I'm happy to share that link with you um, because you know, you no need to reinvent the wheel of all of our <laughs> misgivings. Oh, that, that's and, the uh, whole thing. You absolutely tell the mistakes. Like that's, we, we are not like, this isn't like experts in disaster with Jennifer Gray Thompson. There's a reason why the grammar isn't even really correct is because we have to be human forward all the time, which is we welcome your mistakes. It's all good. Yes, yes. So the, the humanity of it. So really, you know, how this got cooked up was after the, 
the 2017 fires and Debbie Mason called me and said, Adrian, you know, we've got to do something. I know that you have a full-time job and two kids. And you're barely hanging on. You just got evacuated. Uh, let's, let's just imagine what we could do for the community if, you know, if we want to see it return to um, a place where it can uh, find well-being and thrive. And so with that in mind, I reached out to colleagues at the National Center for PTSD, where I am and at Stanford, and said, hey, I've got some, I've got a big need. Who's, who wants to help? And there were a, a team of incredible psychologists who said, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and we're going to, we're going to build a mobile mental health app that's free. It's available in English and Spanish, and it's based in evidence-based science-backed practices for how you work with someone in crisis and through disaster. And through that, we uh, developed Sonoma Rises, and then we've since researched it with adolescents who lost their home and suffered damage to their school and found some really great signals that it was acceptable. And they'd even recommend it to a friend, <laughs> uh, which is a big deal with teens. And, uh, you know, we specialize in mobile mental health apps. And so when COVID hit, uh, the same team said, you know what, we, we could apply a lot of this thinking and framing to addressing COVID, COVID on, a, on a national and even global level. And so we developed COVID Coach, which provides tools to help people manage stress, uh, education about what to expect and how to you know, parent during times of crisis or at least survive it and access to resources like food banks and medical care, getting people what they need. And then a self-assessment where folks can assess depression, anxiety, PTSD, and well-being, and just track their progress over time and see if there's a signal for um, needing a higher level of care. Um, so can you talk about COVID Coach and what you've done there and let our listeners know where they might be able to find it, especially because a lot of our uh, listeners are going to be people who are, co they have like comorbidities of a wildfire disaster and COVID at the same time. And so it's, it may be like the, the COVID app might be able to help them actually through both of those uh, dual traumas. Exactly. Yes. That, um, so COVID coach was kind of uh, an idea that stemmed from when folks are in crisis, they don't have a lot of bandwidth to seek out help and additional services. They kind of need something at their fingertips that can access readily. So it is available in the Apple store or on Google play in both English and Spanish. And it's designed to help people manage stress with tools that are based in science for getting through crisis and also weathering disaster. It has access to resources like food banks or uh, you know guidelines from the CDC that where there's consistent information. And so helping people meet their needs with a resource section. And then there's, of course, the assessments where folks can assess themselves for PTSD, depression, anxiety, and well-being, and determine, hey, you know, I'm noticing that I'm not really, this is kind of languishing over time, and maybe it's, maybe I would benefit from a higher level of care. And then um, finally, just a lot of education on what to expect um, in times of crisis and how to be gentle with ourselves so that we can uh, navigate a sea of massive uncertainty and the intersection of a global pandemic and a natural disaster. And it's really worth the, you know, that what most counties don't know or states don't know is you have to actually request the funding from FEMA for these programs. And so please, if you're in another state, to go through your public sector, call your state senator or your um, or you know your congressperson at the federal level to actually ask to access these funds because a lot of communities will look and they'll be like, we already lost uh, you know so much money on this disaster that we actually can't afford to provide this mental health care. But there are um, avenues that federal funding will come in and actually um, help for at least a couple of years um, to do this kind of work. And I just have to note that I think it's called the HOPE grant. Um, is that correct? I think that's correct. But anyway, do ask for it, ask for what you need. So what's the risk of not attending to mental health in a disaster community? Like, What's the risk of just absorbing trauma and trying to just move on with your life? Yeah. So yeah, what's, what is the, the economic case potentially for attending to well-being? 
Well, what we know from the World Health Organization is that depression is the global leading cause of disability. Anxiety is number six or eight. So that means it's beating out diabetes, cancer, chronic pain, and that the cost to our society for untreated mental health conditions is tremendous, not only for the economic uh, consequences of people not showing up to work or able to participate in the workforce, but also our well being as a nation. And, and so when you don't address trauma in a community, it tends to manifest in other ways. You see more community violence, intimate partner violence. You see kids who are not thriving academically. You see more um, physical health conditions and of course, substance use disorders. It, it has to go somewhere. And so if you don't provide channels to address the pain and acknowledge and validate folks' experiences, then you pay for it in other ways. I think you actually, you end up nursing it in a way that you didn't intend to, which is why you see so many people who are incarcerated have a long history of trauma. So we think, you know, we often think of people who are incarcerated as people who have inflicted trauma on others, which is often true, but there is a cycle of trauma and it's the traumatized, the hurt, the hurt people hurt others, you know, that's, and that can be, um, you know, when, it, when a community goes through a collective trauma, it is terrible, but it's also an opportunity. So can you talk about the dynamics of community trauma and have you been able to track the stages of it, like the stages of grief? Yeah, no, I think so. Or you were speaking about this uh, notion of adverse childhood experiences, which are things like enduring a natural disaster, having a parent who with severe mental illness or not, or having food insecurity all of those events accumulate to affect the trajectory of our lifespan and how we function as adults. And so we're seeing that um, by investing in systems that care for people holistically, not just their physical health, that you get better outcomes. Um, and you look at models, I mean, just naturalistically, like after 9-11 or after Hurricane Katrina, where some people received care and services and others didn't. Um, you, can, you can see that there's more resilience among folks who felt like they had access to support and social support. Um, that really matters for having a resilient response. You need protective buffers. Resilience doesn't lie in just the individual, but also in systems. So in our schools, in our places of worship, in our governments, and even culturally at a, at a national global level. And we use the words uh, resilience a lot and sustainability and, you know, equity too. But I always like to talk about like, how do you do resilience and how do you do equity and how do you do sustainability? And I think you're bringing up an important point. You can actually sustain, you can recover and rebuild. You can do all of those things. But um, unless you attend to the entire ecosystem of, we call it the ecosystem of care, you know, that's what we do is we bring people from our community that have had these experiences and set up systems like you, and we introduce them to newly disaster affected communities. And um, the, you know, I just listened to your um, um, interview with Pat Kerrigan. One of the things that you were talking about was um, that how it can feel when somebody who's been through the same trauma is sitting in front of you and the amount of relief that that can bring. Can you talk about that dynamic? Exactly, that collective understanding and processing of a shared experience. You know, we're neurologically and biologically wired for connection. That's how we survived and came out of caves and off the savannas. <laughs> you know, that's exactly how we heal. So communities do that through art, music, storytelling. And unfortunately with COVID, so much of that collective healing has been halted because we can't gather. Um, and you know, there's opportunities digitally and we're, we're, we're improving those user experiences. But yeah, the, the having a narrative that everyone shares about adversity and enduring it and then, um, you know, I don't even have to say prevailing, but you know, just, saying that, hey, we got, we went through a really hard thing and we got through it. And I think there was also, um, there's that really also matters. This, yeah, sorry, it had a lag. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, 
I found that, you know, my life completely changed, um, you know, because of the fire, like a lot of people, I didn't lose my home, but I will say that, um, I like doing this work because I want, I'm always trying to tap back into that, that time during the fires. And it was all so terrible, but people were so amazing. Like people were, they were um, admirable and some weren't and they're on my list. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I, you know, so I'm not a total Pollyanna about, the, about it, but it is that sort of paradise um, built in hell thing that Rebecca Solnit wrote about in her book um, that in times of great um, struggle and how we can actually uh, turn towards each other. And COVID was weird because it sort of prohibited all of our previous coping skills and and so did that, like, how did you build that into that version of uh, with using technology or of your app, knowing that we could also couldn't hug or congregate? It was really tough to build that function in, um, in that, you know, how do you create a shared experience with a user that's solo on their app? And I think a new part of apps and digital communities will involve a feature that allows folks to safely communicate about their shared experience and to use platforms for uh, if I'm you know displaced in a hotel room while my community is burning can I connect with others and you see that on Facebook pages but I think there's more healing spaces where we could start to have conversations um, for folks who can't gather um, and I, I think the COVID's taught us a lot about the ways we can connect when we are displaced in a disaster, for example. So some learning opportunities there. So I want to talk to you about virtual reality. And if you are looking at that area or not, because, you know, Facebook owns Oculus. And um, I got one for my birthday this year because I wanted to go places and I couldn't go anywhere because COVID. And um, I have found, though, it to be um, an incredibly healing, um, oddly satisfying, soothing experience to go into my virtual reality headsets. And I don't socialize on it, but for many people, though, that might be what we do. You know, because you can play games. I, I do a, an exercise workout called Supernatural, it, which it lands me in places that are beautiful all over the world with music. And the what I'm amazed by is how um, uh, it helps uh, the trauma of, I mean, we really had triple traumas last year because we had the wildfire season. We had a very strange political, um, national, uh, you know, all of that nonsense. And then at the same time, uh, the COVID politics wildfire. So what do you think about, have you, are you interested in that space? Are you venturing into there? Are you already there? The space of VR? I think it's, yeah, I think it's really interesting. There are some startups that have pursued it, like Limbix, for example, create uh, like social anxiety exposures within virtual reality. Uh, there's other use cases for when people are hospitalized and in pain or they're about to have surgical procedures, they use VR to, um, and other mindfulness techniques to, to calm their nervous system response and to prepare for a medical procedure. So I think it's exciting. I'm not personally in that space, but I, I would also like, oh, sorry, I think there's just more of a trend for virtual communities. For example, there's startups that bring groups together with uh, licensed facilitators. For example, I have led one through a, a company called Pace, and it was for individuals going through a divorce during COVID and the racial reckoning and the political fallout and the wildfires um, and just having uh, communities that are matched uh, so that folks are appropriate for groups and to gather. But I, I think the virtual piece is really interesting. And I know that we can up-level these user experiences and iterate upon them with time. So we'll see where it goes. Well, I would love for, I would love to talk to you more about that because I know that it's not like you want to re-experience a disaster through VR because that would probably be very upsetting or I wouldn't want to, but thank you. I mean, but the idea that um, we can actually apply that, the guy who created the, the workout game, it's like a workout game that I use um, calls uh, VR headsets, uh, their empathy machines because you can also like travel while black you know, or you can be in a car, you can actually like sit at the table with Tamir Rice's mother and listen to her. And it's it, it's weird for such a thing that is not reality 
Um, the way that it sets you right down though into somebody else's reality. So anyway, we can table that for another day, but I'm excited about that area. Um, talk to us about what you've learned um, since 2017 that surprised you the most around uh, community trauma. And, and then we wanna get into some advice for other communities that have nothing in place whatsoever for their mental health needs. But what's been the biggest surprise that you've learned in the last three and a half years? Um, there's been many. I think for me is the mental health professional who's clearly biased into thinking mental health is important to nurture. Uh, kind of how do you reach people to, to help them understand the value and importance of mental health and to not only understand it, but to act upon it. It's often deprioritized because there's other things on the hierarchy of needs. And, you know, for, and, and all that to say, I, I thought we would have a lot more engagement with our ecosystem than we did. And I don't think it's because of a lack of need. But of uh, people having mindsets like, oh, well, someone else probably had a harder time with it. And so they should use that resource, not me. Or, you know, I'm, I'm functioning. Like I haven't lost my job or I'm not getting a divorce. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm limping along, but I'm hanging in there. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I need help. So I, I think, you know, if you create these, you have to figure out how people will come. And that's been a, a big learning of mine. And how, and maybe that's where the, uh, the apps will come in or, you know, I, I, I mean, I downloaded it. I really looked at it. I did a couple of self-assessments, but like a lot of people who are in the helping space, um, I did not um, seek any help until like my blood pressure was high. You know, I gained weight. I didn't, I, and then I had to go see a trauma therapist and, and then I had to learn how to breathe. And Susan Farron of First Responders Resiliency, she had to give me a talking to about um, how toxic it is for people who are um, in a helping position to actually not access the help that they need in order to sustain the, the help that is offered. So what do you do, if I can ask, for your own self as sort of the, you know, a leader in this field, though, to help yourself during these um you know, cumulative and multiple traumas we've had since 2017? Well, I wish I could say I was this paragon of self-care, but I, I am not. I am, I do, I feel like, you know, because we are the helpers, we're very, um, not ill-equipped, but not in tune necessarily with their own needs because we're so outward facing for our clients, for our community, for um, our, our um, the folks that we work with, our colleagues. And the, the burnout level is absolutely unreal. I mean, imagine being a psychotherapist, for example, in this unrelenting year where you are for the first time, maybe going through everything that you're patients are going through but you're, you're still sitting there holding space for all that all that emotion and having to compartmentalize your emotion um and not to say that you're acting like a robot or uh, not showing your humanity but you, you know your job is to show up for someone else not yourself and so that's a huge challenge and this year it's just been like i've really grappled with that so I think hugging a tree, spending time in nature, it's like, well, these redwoods have seen war and peace and disease and famine and um, innovation and, you know, longevity. So, you know, something about the nature connection has been very grounding for me in this year. And you do live in, in, a, in a beautiful place for it because you have a river and you have, real, and you have um, redwoods and and you know the opportunities to do that, and that's certainly been hiking has been a huge uh, solace for me. And um, but also my husband has a lot of opinions when I don't take care of myself. So I imagine that yours is the same. If you know, is he ever like, okay, <laughs> stop, mm -hmm. do this, or are there the note there? They notice, and it can be hard to listen to them. So. I just think it's important to have the, I'm trying to have the conversation a lot with um, helpers and leaders about how um, it's hard for us to be vulnerable in, in the way, like we're leaving so much space for other people to be, to, to meet them exactly where they're at. And what I'm learning is like, when I come off a trip, I'm in two fire affected zones for 10 days, 
and I come back, like I, I actually need like four days where I'm not doing any work because I have to uh, get rid of, you know, I have to offload it and you can't go to these communities and just like stand and stand there and just cry all over them. They're looking for you for like some, you know, way through, but you also want to be honest that there is a, um, a price that's paid and, and you have to make sure that you are replenishing that account. So I hope you're doing that for yourself. Well, yeah. thank you. I'm so glad that you're raising awareness of the helpers needing help because usually you're right. It's their partners or their kids who are being like, Hey, Ooh, you're super irritable or you don't talk at dinner anymore. You, you know, you're not participating. You're, you're, your body's here, but your head is not. And um, I think recognizing you don't need to be this stoic figure. And in fact, you can be uh, a more powerful leader when you demonstrate vulnerability and show where where you're hurting and where your heart is and you know you don't need to spill your guts but to show uh part of your humanity is really powerful yeah and then to share your mechanisms you know with other people like to say you know take those days off or you know or listen to your spouse or your partner if they're if they're telling you that yeah and and Granted, you're only going to listen like a third of the time, like, let's be honest, but that third of the time can be what actually gets you um, the space and time that you need. Um, so I wanted to, the, the, the podcast is called, you know, Hide a Disaster, and um, I wanted to see if you could kind of, you know, say that you are, say that if you were speaking to somebody who is a, a mental health care professional or a public sector person, and your community has just undergone a disaster, like what are your first um, steps and what should you expect over the next year? Yeah, that's an, a, an important question, a tall order. And I think we're starting to, because of people like you and your organization, Jennifer, we're getting a better understanding or we're seeing more models for how to do this. You know, we're not just reinventing the wheel. There are uh, examples of things that land and resonate very well and things that, you know, don't have as much uptake. And so I think recognizing the urge to help is going to be feeling very urgent, but it's more of a marathon, not a sprint. You know, we're, I remember in 2017, what can I do? Who can I house? Can I donate clothes? And then, you know, now that we're, you know, three fires later, you know, some of us are really enduring some crisis fatigue where there's been such accumulation of trauma burden yeah. that we're not sure how to respond and it's just exhausting. So thinking about A, developing consultation groups to support you emotionally as you do the work, um, a place where you can be vulnerable and open up about your needs and struggles and stuck points. And then FEMA, you know, does a great job of getting in there and, and offering folks the resources. And then Project Hope comes and does some of the acute care. But thinking about how do you scaffold around those responses to create the ecosystem of care? Is that, you know, virtual digital support groups where, that people don't have to come to a, a physical location to access? Is it, is it mobile apps that are self-guided self-help? Is it you know, a, a mind body experience that involves forest bathing or yoga or mindfulness meditation groups? Or is it, you know, offering individual therapy? Uh, there, there are a lot of ways to scale and address the need. It's um, a matter of not having to, to start from scratch and having to fundraise after in the wake of a disaster to do that, having reserves ready to go so that you can start implementing. Um, that's actually, um, it's very good advice and we will put, so we're about to, um, do a whole big mapping of the American West of all, it's going to take about a year to do that will provide, um, resources so that if you're in Montana, but you want to know what we did in this area, you'll be able to like go and, and link to a news story and then maybe to your homepage, you know, to give people like some avenue towards, uh, moving away from reinventing the wheel, because that was very painful for here, for us is um, even though a lot of people showed up to help, they kind of rush in and then rush out just as quickly and doing long-term care and understanding that you do have to provide some sort of care for your community in years two and three and four, and it goes on. So um, I, I really, um, I just uh, appreciate that beyond. One thing I actually, I just remember that I would like you to talk about is um, a lot of people, what helped me was when I learned about the role of the vagus nerve. 
can you talk about that with fight or flight or flight, or, you know, when you're in that heightened awareness and what that does to your body. And then a couple of techniques that people can use in order to relax the vagus nerve. Cause that, for some reason, that science behind that helped me a lot. Yes. So well, I'm so glad you want to nerd out on uh, neurobiology. It's, uh, it's so powerful to even have just a basic understanding of it because it offers us control and mechanisms for turning the volume up or turning it down. Uh, so that, you know, we're not just a victim to our environment and our circumstances necessarily. So I, I think when you're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, this is fight or flight. I'm on the savanna. I'm going to get eaten by a lion. I have to run. There's fight, flight, freeze. Some even say there's the fourth response, which, which is appease. Um, and those can do conditions have like a cascade of cognitive effects where it's kind of all gas, just go, go, go. But our front, our prefrontal cortex, it's like this conductor for an orchestra of all these cognitive functions like decision-making, judgment, inhibition, planning, creative thinking out of the box. All that turns off when we're activated. Our ability to really slow down and evaluate our options, it's really limited. Um, and so when we want to activate our parasympathetic nervous system and calm down, slow down our breathing, our heart rate, our galvanic, lower our galvanic skin response, then there's a few techniques that we can use. I'm an evangelist of uh, frozen peas. Uh, I think you've heard me talk about this before, but it elicits the mammalian dive response which is, you know, we're mammals, we're not penguins, but when we dive into cold water, our nervous system slow down our breathing and our blood flow. And so you can emulate this through taking a cold shower, but if you want a quick fix, frozen peas are your friend. Okay, so but where do you that's put always them? Because people are going to ask, like, where do you put the peas? You got to get a Yeti and then you take it in the field with you. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, do you put them on your head? Do you put them on your neck? Do you put them under your armpit? Yeah. Like where are like, I, mean, I know this sounds silly, but you know, we try to be as like, as, as direct as possible. Like what's the best place to put frozen peas on yourself? If you are uh, having anxiety or you, you feel like you need to, you want to switch out and into your parasympathetic state, where do you put it? Thank you for clarifying. It is on your face. <laughs> Anything on your face, oh. on your head. That is where you want it. Okay. And then yeah. can you talk about the role of um, breathing? Because that was, that was, I didn't even realize that. I don't think I took a deep breath for two years. So when our sympathetic nervous systems are revved up and the dials like crank to 10, our breathing becomes very shallow. And like our posture is a little hunched, our jaw is clenched, our body just holds the stress and the tension. And our breath is awesome because it's free. <laughs> And it's always available to us. And uh, it's incredibly powerful in um, having like an instant effect. So, you know, the Navy SEALs use a technique called box breathing to, and also first responders use it quite a bit because it helps them regulate, downregulate their nervous system so they can make these really important life saving decisions. Um, and so I can explain it to you now or later <laughs> let's just do it we're here do you want to box yeah. breathe okay i, I love so box I, I've actually, yeah yeah so i have done it with i've adapted it for my family with my kids we did it over thanksgiving because that's just stressful anyway um i don't particularly know how to cook turkey but so you take your hand and you make a turkey okay and you start right here at the base of your hand and the idea is you breathe in, breathe out, and then hold it for four seconds and exhale. So just follow me. Okay. Breathe in. Come to the tip of your fingertip. Hold it for four seconds. Exhale, right here. Inhale to the top of your ring finger. Hold it for four seconds. Exhale. The web of your finger. 
Inhale to the top of your middle finger. One, two, three, four. Exhale. Inhale to the top of your pointer finger. Exhale down the turkey neck. To the top of the thumb. Hold it for four seconds. And then exhale to the bottom of your wrist. I love that. It'll probably sound weird for those of you who are on iTunes. It's like a little bit of heavy breathing there, but um, you know, it's really practical things though, like that. Like I know about box breathing and, and Susan Farron taught it to me, but I did not know about the turkey. So now it's a good way to measure. And I really like that. And it's also something easy to teach to your kids because it's very practical. I love that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was an invention at our house for Thanksgiving where we, the box married the turkey and then we have turkey breathing. <laughs> <laughs> I like it a lot. So Adrian, uh, Dr. Hines, rather, uh, my hope is, is that, uh, this can be an ongoing conversation. I really, um, you know, I, I really admire your work, but, and I really like that you're bringing in technology because a big part of our future in this work, uh, about thir a third of what we will do is about trying to really amplify and, and, and invite and encourage um, the tech sector to look into exactly what you're doing to support the work that you're you're doing use technology in a way that builds actual resiliency that increases equity in disaster because regional equity is, an, is a, just an entirely huge problem but on top of that um you you know we leave a lot of people out of our recoveries and people of color and uh, people who are not um you know well resourced and i do believe that we can sort of level the field a little bit using technology including increasing access to mental health care you know, I mean, that's how we're all getting through is using our mechanisms and we're all entirely human and nobody has it all together. And, um, and you know, anything you can do to build self-compassion and empathy for others. Um, and I think you are making a, your mark in, in the world and in the world I care about hugely and I, am, I admire you and thank you. Thank you so much for having me on and for raising awareness about the mental health consequences of disaster, and also the opportunity for technology to wrap around and scaffold what FEMA is doing, because I know that we can use this as an experience to learn and grow and decrease the divide. There doesn't have to be such a gap in access. There really doesn't, and I was really pleased to see that FEMA released a statement of equity, a request for inputs. So if you haven't seen that, they did it on the 22nd of April, and I can send it to you. Um, I'm very interested in having um, a lot of voices who have been there and experienced it, and, and, and you know, to figure out how to partner with FEMA, how to support them. I always tell them, like, we're not here to supplant you, like, we're here to supplement you because disaster is tough, man. It's hard, and it actually takes um, a lot of collaboration to, for it, you know, to get to the other side. And I feel very lucky that in my county um, that you were at the helm of this really important um, project. And I think because you did provide that with Debbie Mason, that it did um, change, did improve our ability to overcome the subsequent mega fires and pandemic and racial reckoning. And, 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 you know, there's just, there's a lot of work to do, but you have to start someplace. And I'm, Proud to say that in Sonoma County that you started someplace and that we are going to get to the other side. It's going to be long, um, but this is how we're going to do it, which is uh, together. Oh, well, well I'm, I thank you for all the efforts that you're putting forth to help people recognize we have to care about each other just as much as we do for ourselves and our family. And that by thinking about the collective recovery we'll just, we'll be able to endure what, what comes at us in a way that we can't do alone. Absolutely. Once again, uh, Dr. Adrienne Hines on the podcast, um, had a disaster. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, how to disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.